David, thank you very much for uh, giving me a chance to interview you. I am very interested about string theory and I'm looking forward to hear something from you. So what is string theory? When I woke up this morning, it was a bit late, but I didn't care, so I just went ahead and prepared myself. Then I looked at the mirror, my eye was good. So string theory is a theory where, where point particles are replaced by tiny vibrating objects known as strings. And depending on how the strings vibrate and oscillate determines what type of particle they are. The reason why there are so many different particles in nature is because the string can vibrate and oscillate in so many different ways. Now I know you yourself, you happen to be a musician, you play musical instruments. So from the point of view of music, the, this is very much analogous to how a string works in string theory. Let's say if we were to take a string instrument, let's say a violin, for example. A violin or a, I know you play the guitar, they both give rise to overtones and higher harmonics. And as a musician, I know that you're, that you're aware that it is these higher harmonics that are responsible for creating the richness of music. It's the same thing with the strings in string theory. Because of the overtones these strings produce and because of the higher harmonics is the reason why there are so many different particles in nature. So very much like a symphony orchestra, when people are creating a beautiful piece of music, there are many different musical notes. However, in string theory, instead of creating a symphony of music notes, we are creating a symphony of particles instead. Strings, what they can do, they can take on different shapes and forms. A string can either be open, meaning it would just look like a shoelace, it would have two endpoints at the end of it, or a string can be closed, which would look like a loop. The two endpoints, what they would do is they would be attached to one another, and this would be a closed string, and each of them can vibrate in so many different ways. Around the 20th century, physicists, what they were doing is they were looking at the world through two different theories. One theory being Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes gravity, and describes things at the very large scale, such as galaxies, planets, stars. And on the other hand, we are looking at things from, from the world to the very small, that theory being quantum mechanics, which describes mm -hmm. atoms, molecules, electrons, even tinier subatomic particles known as quarks. And these two theories were being looked at differently. However, it seemed natural. It seemed completely natural that these two theories had to be unified into one single theory. I mean, after all, planets, galaxies, and stars, I mean, they're made out of atoms, molecules, and quarks and quarks, so it really didn't uh, make any sense why there should be two separate theories describing reality when the very large is composed of, of the things at the quantum and atomic scale. However, string theory, it does more than just that. What it does, it unifies all the four fundamental forces of nature. Now, there are these four forces. They consist of the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and then gravity. It was around the late 60s, uh, Steven Weinberg's remarkable theory, uh, well, remarkable paper on, his name was a model of leptons. Where he showed how this result is done. He showed how the two forces, the electromagnetic and weak nuclear force, can be unified. Steven Weinberg, Abdus Salam, and Sheldon Glashow. The three men worked on this separately, but they all showed that this was able to be done. And it became known as the electroweak force. So two of the fundamental forces were unified. Then several years later, what happened was there are two other physicists. Their last names were Yang and Mills. What they did is they unified the strong nuclear force with the weak force, with the nuclear weak force and the electromagnetic force. Or you can say they unified it with the electroweak force. So you had three of the unified forces combined. This theory became known as Yang-Mills theory. This is so something with a lot of people who study quantum field theory. However, there is the fourth fundamental force, which is gravity. And generally, when you try to combine gravity, that's when all hell breaks loose, you can say. Usually, people are trying to find a way to combine them. However, string theory, it forces you to combine it with all the other fundamental forces of nature into one big, grand, unified theory. So therefore, it's a theory of everything. String theory originally was not a theory of gravity. It was a theory of particles. It was a theory of a type of a class of particles known as hadrons, particularly a very specific type of hadron known as mesons. A meson, they are composed of two fundamental elementary particles known as quarks. 
one quark and one anti-quark held together by the strong nuclear force. And, and people were really studying the scattering of these quarks. Mm -hmm. Feynman diagrams, they describe particle scattering. They describe particle behavior and how particles interact. For example, you can have an electron and an anti-electron. They can meet at a point and they annihilate with one another. And then these produce a photon. And then after the production of a photon, you can have two quarks, one quark and one anti-quark appearing elsewhere. And then these produce the gluon field. Feynman diagrams, they're looked at different ways. Well, first one would be labeled S, the next one labeled T and the next one labeled U. These are called Mendel stem variables. Physicists were studying this, this property. They're particularly looking at the strong force, at the strong nuclear force. And they were looking at how these particles were behaving. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to make a plot of these particles, okay? They made a plot in the form of what is known as a regge trajectory. So they began to plot these particles. These particles would have a certain mass. Mass, the mass would be labeled on the x-axis, the angular momentum L would be labeled on the y-axis, and each of these particles, they would label them, they start off with one particle, which would have a certain mass and angular momentum, the next particle would have a certain mass and angular momentum, and when they plotted these, these seemed to form a perfectly straight line. These weren't scattered, these weren't scattered off in random directions, but they seem to form a perfectly straight line, which was very interesting. Normally you won't have something which would be that controlled when you're plotting something of this nature. And what they did is they, of course, they drew a line through this. And the two physicists that did this, their names were Chu and Frouchy. These became known as Chu Frouchy plots. And when they kept on drawing this, they kept on noticing the energy level, the mass, they kept on plotting them higher and higher and higher. And the mass and energy, they didn't begin to go down. Because generally when you plot something like this, what's going to happen is it's going to look more like a parabola. It's going to start going up and then eventually it'll start going down. The reason is because you can only give so much mass to a particle if you're giving a particle certain amount of mass, you're giving it a certain amount of energy. Because you're giving the particle a certain mass and a certain energy, normally what would happen is, is the mass and energy would be so great that the particle wouldn't be able to withstand it anymore. Let me give you an example. Let's say if we were to take a basketball, okay? We gave that basketball a spin, we spun it mm -hmm. a certain way, gave it a certain angular momentum. And let's say if we had enough strength to spin that basketball so incredibly fast, what would happen is the centripetal forces that, that would cause that basketball to spin would be so incredibly great that it would cause the material that holds that basketball together to be ripped apart and torn apart and you wouldn't be able to plot it anymore. You would start to see you'd start to see the plot going downwards. And it's the same thing with an atom. If you were to do this with an atom, it'd go through a process, it, it would become ionized, meaning that, that is essentially the atom would in many ways, it would be like the basketball, wouldn't be able to withstand so much mass and so much energy, you can only take a, a certain amount. However, with these true Frouchy plots and when plotting the strong nuclear force, things were very different. Like the plot was, was going down at a point, it kept on going up and up and up. This was, this was very strange. This was very unusual, very peculiar. Physicists also noticed another peculiarity with this. Particularly at the numerical values of these regge trajectories, they noticed the Feynman diagram that was drawn vertically was equal to the Feynman diagram that was horizontal. Now, this is also strange because in quantum field theory, generally you have to add these two Feynman diagrams up. You need to take the sum of these two Feynman diagrams, and these are going to be equal to the total of each other. It wouldn't be this is equal to this, or this one is this. Generally, you would have to add these two up, get the total, and However, this wasn't the case when studying these retro trajectories, when studying the numerical behavior of them, both numerical and analytical behavior. It showed that one Feynman diagram was actually equal and equivalent to the other Feynman diagram turned on its side. So this it's in itself was, this was even more strange in many ways. So because of this, physicists began to draw diagrams a certain type of way. These were what became known as string-like diagrams. These diagrams would be drawn differently. They would be, they would look more like they had loops in them. There would be mm -hmm. a quark on one side and an anti-quark on the other side. 
And when drawing these diagrams, the, this diagram had an interior into it. It wasn't just like a stick or what's known as a stick or tree-like diagram that has a tree-like image with Feynman diagrams. These diagrams actually had more of an interior. So when they want to study the behavior of particles looking at these diagrams, and there was one last question they asked. They said, okay, we have these two quarks. We have one quark here, an anti-quark on this side. If there are these two quarks, what is holding them together? Perhaps, maybe there's something holding them inside the diagram. And they drew it, and when they drew it, they saw it came in the form of a very small string-like structure, a string with two endpoints, with two mm -hmm. quarks being attached to the endpoints. And this was probably the most primitive way I believe people really began to see what strings are in string theory. That there was a young Italian physicist, Gabriel Veneziano, he was trying to study the behavior of this hadronic behavior that are held together by quarks and which is governed by the strong nuclear force. He was trying to find a way to write down down this hadronic behavior in a particular type of amplitude, a scattering amplitude. So Veneziano, he was having trouble, and so were other physicists, having trouble writing this down, down analytically. Leonard Euler, Swiss mathematician, actually came up with a way. He wrote a formula that actually allowed Veneziano to properly write down and describe this behavior, the scattering behavior. Through Euler's remarkable equation, he realized this equation allowed him to write, to properly write down the particle scattering. So once again, Euler, he found a way to write down all these channels in a duality so that they are dual to one another in a way where he can describe this type of scattering behavior. This became known as the Euler gamma function. The Euler gamma function is what he used to describe this, but more famously, this became known as the Veneziano amplitude. However, what it also described, it also described the properties of a string-like structure. Interesting thing about this is that Veneziano, he wasn't looking for this whatsoever. He wasn't looking for any type, for anything to do with strings whatsoever. He was just interested in studying this type of scattering behavior of the strong nuclear force with regards to the ridge H trajectory. So he really found this, this came to him, this string-like structure came when they were looking at these true Frouchy plots. I mean, after all, when they when they drew these new types of types of diagrams, these diagrams have uh, what is known as a particular topology. These were two ways that it was found. However, it was primarily through it was more famously through the Euler, through the Veneziano amplitude that people really saw the string like structure. As time went on, they started to get this graviton started to appear in the theory and they continuously tried to get rid of it because they wanted they didn't want a theory of gravity they wanted a theory of particles however no matter what they tried to do they could not get rid of this graviton it kept on coming up through the mathematics through the equations this graviton would not go away this has to do with a particular structure known as spin the graviton, mm -hmm. what it does, it mediates the gravitational field. And because we have the graviton being produced at the quantum scale, physicists began to realize that, wow, this isn't a theory. This isn't really a theory about just particles. This is really a theory of gravity. But because we're getting gravity at, at the quantum scale, this is a theory of quantum gravity. This is mainly why, why no matter what, you, you become forced to unify the two forces that physicists sought, thought, to, thought to unify for such a long time while the two main theories, quantum mechanics and general rel relativity together, because of this, it forces them to be unified. But because strings, because they describe all the phenomenons in nature and they describe all the fundamental forces, it also unifies the other three fundamental forces together with gravity. During some time, around the 80s, there are also five different versions of string theory. In all these five different versions of string theory, it seemed very strange that there should be five different versions of them. And so there are these five different versions known as type one string theory, type two A, 
type 2b so32 ea cross e8 two of these two of these theories were were hadronic meaning that they described hadrons people really just wanted one big theory it wasn't until till the physicist edward witten in 1995 what he did is he showed that each of these five theories of string theory are actually different manifestations essentially of the same thing people are just looking at one theory in different ways and because of this he showed that all five of the versions of string theory really belong to an even bigger a bigger underlying framework known as m theory and in the center of this web-like structure, you can write the M theory, which is a which is an eleven-dimensional theory of supergravity. Yeah, okay. what is eleven dimensions and how? Yeah, come? this is something string theory is both famous and infamous for. In order for the theory to work, you need there to be extra dimensions of space, extra spatial dimensions. In the earliest versions of string theory, which which purely described a class of particles known as bosons, there were actually originally 26 dimensions, 25 dimensions of space, one of time. One of two of the ways actually to derive this, how mm -hmm. it got derived. This has to do one way, involves something known as the Riemann zeta function, working out how you get 26 dimensions in string theory. This is actually under very particular conditions when working, when looking at string theory and quantum field theory. What mm -hmm. happens is you'll find you will actually come across this. And there is another way using what is known as the Verasaro algebra. Using the Verasaro algebra and counting what are known as the spurious, what are known as spurious states of that. And that also is another way to show how you end up getting D, D, D equaling dimension equals 26. Okay. So, from 26 dimensions, how come it came down to 11 dimensions? 11, right. Yeah. Right, they began to study super string theory this is this is string theory which has to do with a phenomenon known as supersymmetry the supersymmetric particles are something that arise out of string theory through the mathematics of string theory and also through the mathematics of group theory these supersymmetric properties you can think of them kind of like kind of like a particle and an antiparticle ascending instead of opposite charge they would have opposite spin and, and by now we we know that what if these two, if there was a perfect symmetry in nature, if these were exactly equal to each other in mass, the reason why I brought up supersymmetry is with the introduction to supersymmetry, we found out that we were actually able to compactify these extra dimensions from 26 dimensions to 11 dimensions. Typically, a lot of people, they want things because we live in a in a three spatial dimensional world and one in one dimension of time. A lot of people would really want to see a theory which had four dimensions, three of space, one of time. However, instead they ended up getting this 11 dimensional theory. We would have detected these long ago. However, what we do know is because we haven't detected these supersymmetric particles, because we couldn't detect them immediately, it means that these supersymmetric partners must have a greater mass. Their mass much, they must be greater. And because of that, is going to require stronger, more powerful colliders to be able to detect these. Why? Because string theory occurs at such fundamental levels, it is going to take such tremendous energy to be able to probe things at that level. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this about um, when should this, when this should be found. Are we, are we investing too much time in trying to find these? This really is something that really split the physics community into two groups. This isn't, very, this isn't too much like a traditional theory. This is a massive framework and a lot of different things are being studied regarding the string theory. A lot of new brand new mathematics are arising from string theory and a lot of physics that don't even have to do with brand unification are being studied in string theory right now as well. Because the more we go into string theory, the more doors seem to open and the more it seems to be, the more complex it seems to become. I would like to conclude that that much work has been, is coming out of string theory. Much work is continuing to come out of string theory, despite the fact that people still completely looking at a theory of quantum gravity. Maybe we haven't made the progress that was promised, but regardless, there has been a ton of progress that has been made incredible progress is continuing to be made because there's still so much to be learned about it because because we still have such a small understanding of the theory as a whole or this framework as a whole there is still so much more to learn on the horizon and we will see where it takes us
Thank you very much. You're welcome. I would like to stop for some questions. If you have any questions, wait, wait. Yeah. 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 What? My idol. I'm sure Sean will want to hear that. Wait a second. Wait. <laughs> Okay, continue. Use. 